Okay, the next talk up is from Bocaria on their next generation at memory inference acceleration device with over a thousand risk five cores. There's two speakers, Robert Beckler and Martin Snellgrove. Bob Beckler is the vice president of product at Untether AI, a Silicon Valley veteran and proven senior executive with industry leaders such as Altera, Xilinx, and Brainchip. He brings to the company a wealth of experience in the development and marketing of FPGAs, software tools, vision processors, and artificial intelligence acceleration devices. Martin Snellgrove is the co-founder and chief technology of officer at Untether AI. Dr. Snellgrove has held progressive roles at product de and design services firms at scale. Prior to this, he spent many years in academic R&D leading to the commercialization of products in digital, sig digital signal processing and mixed signal processing, and he's widely acknowledged as a pioneer in this field. Dr. Snellgrove is an author of 36 patents and over 100 refereed publications. So let's go to the talk. Hi, welcome to Hot Chips. I'm Bob Beachler, the Vice President of Product here at Untether AI, and I was the Acting VP of Hardware Engineering during the development of Boca Rhea. With me here today is... Martin Snellgrove, CTO and a co-founder. You know, it's amazing that it was only 10 short years ago that the AlexNet paper came out and started the current AI summer. Since that time, we've seen an explosion of neural network architectures. Untether AI was founded in 2018 in order to come up with a new method of compute in order to provide the efficiency and the throughput necessary for today's AI workloads. In 2020, we introduced our first generation of devices, the Run AI 200, which offered 500 teraops of performance with an efficiency of eight tops per watt. Here today at Hot Ships, we're introducing our next generation device, Boca Rhea, which offers two petaflops of inference acceleration with an amazing 30 tops per watt in energy efficiency. AI inference presents three key challenges to the developers of chips. One, the increasing computational requirements and the power efficiency necessary for these AI workloads. We're also seeing a tremendous explosion in the architectures of neural networks, and you have to have the flexibility to be able to adapt to the changing neural network landscape. And finally, and particularly in inference, you wanna make sure that you're doing things as efficiently as possible and using the right data types to ensure the necessary accuracy, but at the same standpoint, providing energy efficiency. So therefore, what we have done is to develop an architecture that is the right mix of coarse-grained architecture to be able to provide the compute performance and also interleaved with that the types of data types necessary for both efficiency, but also to ensure the accuracy. Accuracy is critical because it can cost millions of dollars in the case of recommendation engines. In fact, McKinsey says that 35% of Amazon's revenue is based upon their recommendations. Also, when you start looking at ADAS and autonomous vehicles, accuracy is critical because it can cost injury and lives if the accuracy is not maintained. Okay, when we sit down to architect our AI inference acceleration, the first thing that we saw is that 90% of the energy in doing neural network compute is in movement of data, either from external memory or on internal caches, and only 10% is really done in the compute. So what we've done at Untether AI is really to turn that upside down and make sure that we are being as efficient as possible in our data movement and put the compute where the data exists. We also architected our architecture to have the right amount of compute at the granularity level necessary and specifically tailored for acceleration of neural networks. And then finally, we've done a lot of research in the different data types in order to ensure accuracy. What we found is that FP32, which gives you the ultimate accuracy, requires too much compute. And you can get the same level of accuracy with a BF16 data type, but we've also found that we've developed a new FP8 data type that quadruples the efficiency from BrainFloat 16, but at the same time preserves the accuracy necessary for today's AI workloads. At Untether AI, we're pioneering at memory compute, where we place the compute element directly attached to memory cells. We feel this is the sweet spot for AI acceleration. 
If you look at traditional von Neumann architectures, that's where you have all of the energy expenditures and data movement, moving from DRAM, having large hot caches on chip. Now there's also in-memory compute where people are trying to use the memory cell in order to do the fundamental multiply accumulate function. While this provides very low energy, all the supporting circuitry around it in order to compensate for the analog effects, as well as all the digital logic you need for the other non-MAC functions, ends up degrading the actual performance improvements you see within memory compute. Whereas at memory compute, we use a standard digital logic process, we use standard SRAM cells, but we provide tremendous energy efficiency because we have a very short distance for the data to travel from the storage cell to the actual compute element. So here at Hot Chips, we're pleased to introduce Bocaria. It's a two petaflop, 30 teraflops per watt at memory inference accelerator. We can do this because of our innovative at memory compute structure. Each of our memory banks, of which there are 729 per chip, each has a dual RISC-V processor. We run these at 1.3 gigahertz using a TSMC seven nanometer process. Because we place the processing elements directly attached to memory, that gives us our energy efficiency on the order of 30 teraflops per watt. There's 238 megabytes of SRAM on a given chip. And because the processing elements have their own dedicated memory, we have tremendous memory bandwidth on the order of a petabyte of memory bandwidth. The device is ultimately scalable. We have direct chip-to-chip -chip interconnect using PCI Express so that we can place multiple chips together in order to expand to the largest natural language processing networks. Also, because it's a spatial architecture, we can make smaller devices using less memory banks. We support multiple different data types from integer four up to BF16 for the utmost in compute accuracy. So Let's look at that memory bank, smart memory, it's computing memory. Those two RISC processors actually each run four row controllers, and the row is really the, uh, the, the locus of control for this thing. So we have our, a whole control hierarchy, 729 banks, two RISCs each, four subcontrollers in each one, and each of those controllers is running a 64-element SIMD machine. Now, there's your hierarchy of control to go with the, the huge number of threads that are in a typical neural network. And now in, on the side of connectivity, you need connectivity within a row. And there we have a thing called a rotator cuff, which we can configure as we like to do nearest neighbor communications within the row. And so you can rotate things around and permute them and so on, so that each output result can see each input activation value. That's within a row. Next level of hierarchy up is a network on chip. So the row controller can do a send or do a receive on a, on a socket. And the, uh, there's a, a background network we'll talk about that, that takes care of that. But from the, the point of view of the road, the row, it can send data at a 70 gig rate north or south and at a seven gig rate east or seven gig west. And a, that's, not the, that's not our system rate, that's what an individual row of our 6,000 rows can, can handle. And let's move down into the processing element. That's where the, the real at memory side of what we're doing happens. That's where we have the, the data for all the coefficients and that's where the actual number crunching happens. So there's the memory first of all, and it's a, a low power, high density static RAM array. We're, we use standard bit cells but we use them better than you'll see in a, in a typical uh, SRAM because we know exactly the pattern in which we're, we're using data. So we don't do a fetch without using the data and we swing the data the, the least we can to get efficient communication. And that SRAM bolts pitched matched onto a processing element that's computing a value. So if you have a 64 element vector, each processing element is computing one of the output channels, would be a typical use. And so inside that processing element, well, it's basically a multiplier accumulator and some, um, some masking technology so that you can get conditional execution, just as you do in a, any other SIMD machine. And that processing element 
has as its two inputs a coefficient from the VSRAM and an activation that's from this rotator cuff. And on each cycle, you can grab a new value from the memory, grab a new input, and update your output. There are also some temporary registers, and there's a network on chip connection there. Th that processing element is basically built for 8-bit floats, but as a subset or by, by using it multiple times, you can do int 8s, BF16s, and single time you can do int 4s. Lots of power saving features. If, uh, if an activation is zero, nothing clocks. There's support for structured sparsity, a two out of four kind of structured sparsity technique. And all of what I've described, you'd, from a map reduce point of view, you'd call a map function. That is, I've been describing local operations within the PE, but there's some reduce functions, such as you need for softmax, where you have to add up all the values in a vector, or layer norm, where you're doing overall statistics in a, in a vector. And for, for those kinds of things, we have a reduce layer that computes a, a sum or a max and pumps it back to the controller. All of this stuff is connected together, built entirely about energy efficiency. So communication of the, of the with this cuff is adjacent to adjacent, and the knocks are all minimum distance travel. So that uh, aided floating point, we optimize it for inference, not for training. So the, the, the picture here shows uh, sign bit and three, four, or five exponent bits and your choice of four, three, or two mantissa bits to go with that. And for training, you typically want to go with more exponent, less mantissa. For inference, you want to go with more mantissa, less exponent. It's about getting precision results. So we've optimized for the inference side and we're using FP8 instead of the int style, we're getting twice the energy efficiency and tighter die size with floating point relative to integer eight at, at essentially the same kind of precision. So for accuracy, relative to FP32, if you use BF16 mode, you get essentially perfect results. If you use FP8 mode or int8 mode, you get similar results, but in FP8, we're getting four times the throughput because there's essentially only a four or five bit multiplier relative to the int8. Now moving back up to the, the RISC-V level, it's a standard RISC-V with additional instructions focused on those processing elements that we saw. And those, those instructions do things like a gem V, they do uh, reduce and, and so on. So there's this collection of instructions each handled with a state machine in the particular controller so that those engines can go and grind by themselves while the risk moves along and handles the multiple threads. Each of those risk processors sits there thinking that it's running natively C. It just has these command queues it can fill up. Each one has 6K of local memory a 32-bit ALU with things like a 32-bit multiplier that you use to aggregate row kinds of functions. So if you're doing something like uh, softmax, you're, you're doing the, uh, the reciprocal, for example, would be done in the, uh, in, in the risk and the, all of, all of the uh, exponentials and so on would be done locally. Going back up again now to the, to the chip level, we talked about the, uh, the, the 70 gigabyte per second north-south, for example, network on chip. That aggregates, that's all pipelined so that all of these rows are capable of throwing stuff onto, onto those uh, network interfaces at full speed. So you end up with nearly two terabytes per second in each direction aggregate. There's also a, a knock that goes around the the periphery of the chip to the, all of the I.O. devices, that gives you another uh, 140 gig in each direction to get to LPDDR and PCI Express and so on. And that knock is not an off-the-shelf knock. It's a knock that's first of all designed for energy efficiency. Data gets sent the minimum possible distance, meaning at the minimum possible energy in any XY pattern that the, the manager chooses to set up. And the model from the point of view of the risk processors is 
a circuit switch model. All that they do is throw data onto a socket or pull it off a socket. Externally, those things are wired together. The 6K of code in each risk doesn't have to worry itself about connectivity. So talking about the input output, there's by 16 Gen 5 PCI Express, that's 63 gigabytes per second, that gets you back and forth to a host. And we also have by 8 PCI Express that we can use for chip-to-chip -chip connectivity. So you can scale this thing out to as many chips as you like. And that socket interface I, I mentioned, there's absolutely no difference in how the code looks, whether it's transmitting chip to chip, on chip to a neighboring row. So that's how it scales out to infinite chips and each one of them has this multi-level memory architecture. So they, there's 200 odd meg of memory just directly in those processing elements. We have some scratch pad memory for things like temporary storage of activations for layer norm and so on. And if that on-chip scratch pad and the on-chip in processor memory isn't enough, there's 32 gigabytes of uh, LPDDR5 that you can get to. So what Martin just described is the beauty of our spatial architecture. And this provides us some scalability benefit. We can reduce the number of memory banks that we have on a given chip to fit different form factors and power energy envelopes. So within our Bocaria family, we'll be scaling from sub one watt devices all the way up to the B4 infrastructure class device that we described. This allows us to address multiple different price performance points and form factors. We'll be having a series of cards scaling from single wide M.2 all the way up to PCI Express. And as you saw, we have a very flexible I.O. ring, and that makes it chiplet ready so that for those that want to integrate directly die to die within it with SOCs, we have that capability as well. So let's talk about our PCI Express card. We're going to be able to fit six of these Bocaria devices onto a single PCI Express card, giving us a tremendous amount of SRAM capability to be able to scale to the largest language models. And with our chip-to-chip -chip and card-to-card -card interconnect, we can now make very powerful server implementations. We also have the external LPDDR5 giving us a tremendous amount of storage on the chip. So overall, we have this scalability feature to allow us to provide the utmost performance as well as energy efficiency in a standard PCI Express form factor. Now, the silicon is only as good as the software that supports it. Our Imagine software development kit provides an automatic graph lowering capability to take neural networks from common machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch and reduce it into the kernel code that runs on these RISC-V processors. We provide a model garden of pre-created neural networks, but the majority of our customers have their own neural networks that they've already trained. We provide automated quantization capability to reduce it into the data types required. We do the compilation and mapping to the kernel code. We do physical allocation in terms of placing those kernels onto the silicon and interconnecting them automatically. We have a suite of analysis tools where you can see floor plans, you can see code profiling. And then finally, once we have our programming file, we can put that into our chip and it's controlled through an easy to use runtime that has a C or Python based API to allow it to be integrated into the rest of your ML operations frameworks. Now, our spatial architecture allows us to do something very unique. Normally, you would take a graph and run it sequentially on a CPU or a GPU, but we have the ability to replicate layers. So when we look at a neural network, we'll look at the bottlenecks and maybe replicate a layer or even a subgraph. We can also run entire neural networks in parallel on our chip. So we use this capability to fine tune the networks to utilize the right amount of resources to hit the performance targets necessary for a given application. So it's the combination of the software and the silicon architecture that really brings out the benefits and efficiency of at memory compute. With Bocaria, we've hit a new milestone at 30 tera operations per second per watt. At the same time, in a single PCI Express card, providing up to 12 petaops of performance. 
that's more than five times more than what's available today in terms of petaflops per card and a 7x increase in energy efficiency. It's our energy efficiency that provides us with our throughput because we can pack more compute into a given form factor and a given power envelope. If you look at the ML perf benchmarks, we're on the order of 15 to 80 times more throughput for these types of vision networks. And as you heard from Martin, we have dedicated circuitry for attention networks. So when you look at a natural language processing network like BERT Base, we're on the order of eight times greater throughput and 15 times greater in terms of the energy efficiency when you measure queries per second per watt. So with Bocaria, we're solving the three key challenges that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. First of all, its at-memory compute structure provides unrivaled energy efficiency, which drives the ability to increase the throughput and acceleration of neural networks. It's a scalable spatial architecture so that we can make smaller devices and larger devices, and we can interconnect them together in order to scale to the largest natural language processing models. And because we've selected the right level of compute granularity, we can support today's neural network architectures and be future-proof for future neural networks. And because we support multiple different data types, the user can trade off between accuracy and throughput for their specific application. Thank you for attending our Hot Chips presentation. At this point, we'll open it up for any questions that you might have for myself or Martin. Okay, thank you, Bob and Martin. Um, I'll start off with a question from Sabarish Ravi Kumar from Waymo. He says, congratulations, and these are some impressive PERF and PERF per watt numbers. Will we see an ML PERF submission at some point? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, and, you know, as the previous session at, at Grok said, you know, as a startup, we focus on uh, solving our customers' issues first, and ML Perf is is next. So yes, we have every intention to do so, but it's really a resource issue in terms of when we're going to get to the, that point that we have the bandwidth to be able to submit there. It's on our roadmap, um, but it's not imminent. Okay. Uh, Kevin Cruel from Tyrius Research asks, are you considering stacked 3D SRAM memory in the future? Martin, would you like to take that? Go off mute. No, 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 that's a corporate question, Bob. I'll leave you to handle that one. <laughs> well, so thanks for the question, Kevin. So, you know, we're an at-memory compute company, so we're constantly monitoring new innovations in memory technologies. Um, and we'll use the appropriate type of memory technology that we feel is manufacturable at scale. Um, today, that's with on-chip SRAM, but in the future with stack die, um, as that becomes more manufacturable and cost effective, that's certainly something that we can analyze and entertain. Okay, uh, Cliff Young from Google asks, how are instructions supplied to the RISC-V cores? Do they just run out of the six kilobytes of local SRAM uh, and code must be managed manually? Martin, would you like to take that? Sure. And I wouldn't say manually, it's the compiler's job, usually. Uh, so the compiler takes PyTorch or whatever whatever you start from and chops it up into, into six byte, I was going to say byte size pieces, but 6K byte size pieces, and distributes them on, on the, on, in, the uh, in the system. You certainly can code that stuff up manually if you want, but normally it's easy enough to do systematically. 6K is actually pretty big, you know. The, uh, the threads we're running need to run very fast, and there just isn't time to use all 6K in most, most uh, applications. And I guess following on the topic of the RISC-V, um, Sabarish Ravi Kumar from Waymo asks, um, are you able to share what RISC-V processor was used? Is it open source or homegrown or licensed? Yeah, it's a, it's a custom designed processor. Um, we use, start with the RV32 EMC instruction set, I think as is shown in Martin's slides, um, but we've custom implemented that. 
Um, because we have so many of them, it, it's very important that we do it as the most efficient way possible. Also, with the 20 plus inst custom instructions that we've designed specifically to take advantage of our architecture and inference workloads, that's also all custom circuitry that we've developed and extended the standard RISC-V instruction set to be able to uh, utilize our architecture and to optimize for inference workloads. Okay, next, um, Axel Chevalier from Next Silicon asks, what is the power of the six-chip uh, PCIe card? Sure. Well, we're going to design that for what we call 100% Gen V, which is the worst case maximum operating, and that'll be around 400 watts. We typically see, however, that when the actual inference workloads are being run, um, they run at about half that power consumption. So uh, we'll de over design it, obviously, from a power supply and cooling standpoint. Um, but typically, we'll see workloads running in the you know, 200 to 300 watt range. Uh, we have a question from As Asit Mishra at Apple. Uh, what kind of structured sparsity is supported? Martin, why don't you take that? Sure. So, so uh, basically, two out of four. So, so the uh, you, you have a, a register with a, a coded uh, value that says which of the four activations any given which of a group of four activations any given coefficient is going to going to hit, and pairs of coefficients share that. And you get a performance speed up from that. Yeah, it's a, it's two x. If you if you use that, you get two x power, two x uh, uh, cycle, in, and two x model size. It's a two x win on everything. I, I will interject that the the tops numbers that we show do not include structured sparsity. Um, so you would multiply by a factor of two if you were to take advantage of that. Um, next question from Ashtosh Dar from NVIDIA. What is the Treg file and what is its size? So I'll do that one, Bob. So yep. I think Walid uh, stuck in a, a partial response in, in the Slack, but it's, it's temporary registers. It's uh, a couple of registers per processing element and it's just a traditional way you'd use a, a register. It's a fast place to store a temporary value. You can store stuff in memory. Memory is a little slower. You can even use the network on chip to store stuff. Send messages to yourself if you like. So there's expansion space available. But when you want a, a single cycle quick place to put something, the a temp reg is the place to put it. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, all we have time for right now. So thanks very much for your talk. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks.